on business incorporated today. Electricity supply worsens in South Africa's ESCOM clarifies load shedding schedule. And Chief Economist of Development Bank of Nigeria advocates inclusive growth for impacts. Egypt to get $1.5 billion financing from International Islamic Trade Finance Corporation. Good afternoon. Welcome to Business Incorporated on Channel Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Let's start off as usual with market numbers and what we see right there is mostly positive at intraday for Africa. Starting with Nigeria, it's marginally positive at 0.02%. Uh, we're doing that 52,000 at 607.3. For Africa, uh, South Africa, GSC, looking very good at 1.15%. Of course, uh, 74,035.81. Looking at other countries on the continent, Egypt is also positive at 0.68%. At intraday, while Kenya closed positive, a rare one for Kenya there, closed positive on Friday, 1.68%. And then we move over to the Middle East, where it's mixed, but more positive at intraday. Starting with Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi was in the negative, 0.30%. Uh, there you have the numbers there. And then Dubai in the positives are 0.21% at 3,359.50. Looking at other regions now, uh, Saudi Arabia in between, but positively so uh, at intraday. And Qatar looking very good at 1.10%. Let's move over to uh, Europe now, where relations uh, between Germany and France are considered the essential backbone of the European Union but they've been dogged by he ill feelings on numerous aspects in recent past. During celebrations on Sunday, marking the anniversary of a post-war friendship treaty that was signed 60 years ago, leaders of the two countries tried to gloss over these divisions. Well, uh, let's help, help us to understand more about this. We have Chris Kober uh, from DW now joining us from Berlin. Hi, Chris. Good afternoon. Good to have you this uh, new week uh, what have been the disagreement between berlin and paris what what is the bone of contention First of all, the personal relationship between uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and French President Emmanuel Macron has been less warm since Mr. Scholz assumed office in late 2021. Since then, complaints by the French side have been mounting that ties with the chancellery in particular have been strained. Whereas under former Chancellor Angela Merkel's leadership, there was close cooperation. Uh, now, sometimes French government officials didn't even know who to talk to on the German side. They complained. But apparently, there are structural problems that go further than that. Berlin opposed a French-led initiative for a European price cap on gas last fall. Uh, Berlin has also been putting the brakes uh, on the Paris' demand of sh uh, sharing the debt of European member states. Also, German officials say Berlin sees little need for a new sovereign EU fund that France considers necessary to help European industry make investments to remain competitive against U.S. firms benefiting from tax credit credits uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act. On the other hand, the leadership in Paris was quite upset when German Chancellor Scholz held a speech on the future of Europe last year in Prague and didn't even mention France, which has been Germany's closest ally since the end of World War II. So the differences even led to a joint French-German government meeting being cancelled last fall. It did finally take place over the weekend as part of the landmark Elysee Treaty's anniversary celebrations. Yeah, so you, you did mention uh, Olaf Scholz there, and of course the French president. A lot of sentiments there, but how are they addressing the problems? Well, they mostly try to gloss them over. Uh, however, here and there, the difficulties in this important relationship did shine through. The Franco-German motor is a compromise machine, well-oiled but sometimes loud and needing hard work, uh, German Chancellor Scholz said in a speech at the Sorbonne University in Paris. And President Macron said uh, Germany and France were two souls in the same body and the locomotive of a united Europe. The two governments issued a joint statement flagging plans to press ahead with joint initiatives for a main battle tank and space programs and in developing hydrogen production and battery technologies. Berlin and Paris also committed vaguely to work 
on an EU overhaul of the electricity market. Now, despite this show of pageantry and unity, differing opinions became highly visible when it came to the most pressing issue for European leaders these days, which is the war in Ukraine. Mr. Macron made clear that, quote, nothing is excluded regarding the possible delivery of French-made heavy tanks, with pressure growing on Berlin, Berlin to supply Ukraine with highly regarded German uh, Leopard tanks, Mr. Schultz stopped short of any pledge, instead insisting all allies must work together. However, Germany's foreign minister went further than Mr. Schultz's comments. Uh, in an interview with French TV, Annalena Baerbock said that Germany would not stand in the way if Poland wants to send its Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine as it tries to bolster its forces ahead of an expected new Russian offensive. Now, that would indeed be quite a shift in German foreign policy. Mm. All right. Uh, well, let's uh, leave that and go to the markets now. Expectations for the week in trading so far. It's been a slow start to the week with uh, exchanges in China closed over the Lunar New Year Festival. Uh, also, it's more of a trickle rather than a stream of economic data that investors are expecting this week. The head of the European Central Bank, uh, Christine Lagarde, will be speaking at the New Year's reception of the Deutsche Börse tonight with investors likely to gauge disappearance uh, for fresh indicators on how the ECB will continue its fight against high inflation. So far, European markets have have been having an upbeat start of the week with the DAX in Frankfurt gaining around seven tenths of a percent in the early parts of today's trading session. All right, uh, Chris, thank you so much for that and enjoy the rest of your day. Let's go all the way to Japan now, where Juliana uh, has been there. He started this conversation in the morning with Ladi on Business Morning uh, at the Nigeria-Japan Business Forum, which officially starts on Wednesday. But of course, their arrivals, conversations have started. And uh, of course, we have Juliana right there to bring us up to date. Hi, Juliana. I, I, I wanted to speak a Japan language to you. I, I, I forgot. I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> How's it going there, Juliana? How's arrivals, registration? Who do we have there? Businesses? I, I believe some government officials from Nigeria are also there. What's going on, really? That is absolutely right. Good evening, by the way, <laughs> because I'm nine hours ahead of you. In fact, eight. I'm, I'm now nine hours ahead of GMT, but wow. eight hours ahead of, um, of West African time. And greetings from Nishinjiku um, City um, at the Hilton, where you are absolutely right. Um, the Japan Nigeria Business Forum will be taking place here over the next couple of days. And it's an absolutely huge event. Um, I don't think that should be understated because uh, this uh, forum spans several industries. I believe the chief host is the Honourable Ambassador to Japan. But then, of course, um, we've got the Ministry of Trade and Investment. We have the Ministry of Communication as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, all taking place, all converging um, here in Tokyo. And it is a mutual relationship. It's a, a, a relationship that has spanned over six decades now. We know that Japan has a pretty ageing uh, population compared to the very youthful um, energy of uh, Nigeria. And I think Japan now um, understands that with China, encroaching onto Nigeria with lightning speed, that they want to make sure that they are a cut above the rest and they want to um, offer a diversified portfolio of investment opportunities for the nation. And we know that uh, Nigeria is uh, trying its best to diversify away from oil. I believe um, last year, trade between Nigeria and Japan reached about 300 a billion US dollars, and the vast majority of that was Nigeria exporting liquefied natural gas. And now, because uh, Japan doesn't have much of an arable land, I believe that uh, the arable land in Japan is less than 20%. It's in desperate need of natural resources. And we know that Nigeria has been blessed abundantly with that. So that's part of 
uh, the discussion, as well as, of course, Japan being one of the strongest economies in the world. They have a service sector um, in a, that is not matched by anywhere. And I think Nigeria is really keen to tap into that, particularly uh, the Ministry of Communications. We are going to be having the Honourable Minister um, arriving possibly any time now. So it's certainly going to be a robust couple of days. Of course, Channels TV has an exclusive invite, so I will be uh, bringing you all uh, the back uh, behind the scenes details when I am back in London and of course throughout the week. Hopefully yeah. I'll be able to secure some pretty high profile interviews. Yeah, well I know you're going to do that Juliana. I trust you to always do that. But j just before we, we get to the markets, in the morning uh, you did arrange an interview with uh, a business head uh, of, a, of a logistics company and you, you know you, you, you just said the figures there about the trade between Nigeria and Japan which unfortunately is more about oil and gas and Nigeria Nigeria is desperate to have a diversified uh, economy. You know, so if we have uh, Japan very good in services, what do you see? What are some of the conversations and the takeaways that you think both businesses and the government, as well as individuals, can take away from that that could be practical and, and realistic, you know, that could be implemented to make a difference in the country? So people are not just going to Japan to have fun. Absolutely. It's very, very cold um, here, by the way, um, Inny. Um, so I'm not sure I'd put fun up there um, at the top, although, of course, you can you can have fun in very cold weather, as we do in London. But we are expecting to have a keynote address on Wednesday morning uh, by Hajia Saratu Umar. She is um, the executive secretary at the Nigeria Investment Promotion um, Commission, NIPC. So she is going to be talking about um, cross-border uh, transactions and the ease of doing business. I think the ease of doing business is one of the most significant areas that investors, not just here in Tokyo, but across the world, want to know about. Because, of course, they want to um, make sure that if they are doing business in Nigeria, it's completely transparent, um, it is easy, and they are speaking to the right people. So I think it's going to be very interesting hearing uh, from that. And I also told you that we are expecting uh, to be hearing from the Honourable Minister of Communications and Digital Economy, Professor Issa Ali Ibrahim Pantami. And I think there is a real keen interest to make sure uh, that Nigerians are able to access and harness the best of technology. Because, of course, if you want to prosper as an economy, you have to make sure uh, that your people are online. And with over a 200 million population, that has been incredibly difficult. Although Japan has over 125 million uh, people here. It is a, a quite a dense uh, country here, particularly for an island nation. So I do believe as well that Nigeria are going to try and tap into some of those technology expertise uh, that the Japanese have been able uh, to harness so well to make sure uh, that they can uh, provide those technological capabilities across the entirety of the country. That is what I'm expecting. So I think the NIPC and uh, the Ministry of Communications are really are going to be at the, the forefront of talks here to make sure that they are able to attract um, investors that will be able to diversify um, our economy, which is so desperately needed at this time. Yeah, thank you, Juliana. I don't know, are you able to touch base with London and get those market numbers? Are you able to give us that? I am. I do have a little bit of magic here called a pen <laughs> paper. Um, and I have had a look. And I can tell you the Japanese yen is a very, very strong economy. But let's have a look at the FTSE um, at the moment, which is up. It's up 0.15%. FTSE 100 up 2 in by 0.22%. And the FTSE 250, that domestic market, that's up by 0.36%. I was just talking about uh, currencies and the British pound at the moment is trading up against the US dollar by 0.11%. Also trading up against the euro by 0.38%. And the British pound is trading up against the Japanese yen by 0.48%. All right, Juliana, thank you so much. And of course, we'll get more from Tokyo. Konnichiwa. <laughs> All right, let's take a break now. When we come back, we'll stay on the African continent and give you stories uh, making the rounds on the continent. So join us again. <laughs> 
Welcome back to Watching Business Incorporated here on Channel Television. Now let's start with Nigeria. International and domestic agencies expect Nigeria's gross domestic product to grow uh, between 2.9% and 3.1% for 2023, not very far off from what we had in 2022. The Chief Economist of Development Bank of Nigeria, Professor Joseph Nana, believes that the data, those numbers, may not be the core for Nigeria as the lack of inclusive growth deters the impacts of such growth. Nigeria's food inflation numbers, they continue to inch upwards, albeit that we know that um, um, food makes up a great proportion of the headline inflation figures here in the country because we import a lot of these inputs. Um, as a result, um, food prices have gone up, reducing as well as inflation, so which reduces the purchasing power of households and, quite frankly, MSMEs. Um, as a result of that now, we've also seen rising government debt. Uh, we've also seen a slower growth in terms of quarter-on-quarter -quarter GDP. Um, to that end, um, for me, I would say this is the end of easy money in terms of quantitative easing globally. And as it relates to Nigeria, for the wins, uh, we'll, we close 2022 with probably around a 3%, 3.1% GDP growth. Notwithstanding, uh, I feel as though the growth was not inclusive enough because we know there are so many households and MSMEs still struggling, still hoping for the better to happen in the country. And because that's not forthcoming, I would say there isn't really any bright spots for households and MSMEs for now, simply because the growth in which we witnessed and we observed in the country wasn't inclusive. And now to South Africa, where power utility ESCOM has announced that it will not be on permanent stage two and three load shedding in the country. The company was responding to various reports on Sunday declaring permanent stage two and stage three load shedding that is hitting the country for the next two years. ESCOM spokesperson uh, said that uh, this was a measure that was considered, but ultimately it was rejected. As part of recovery plan, ESCOM will be addressing systemic issues, especially those relating to leadership and the entire organizational culture of the power utility. And in Senegal, about 20 African heads of state and private sector leaders are among around 1,500 uh, delegates meeting in Dakar, the Senegal capital, this week for a high-level discussion on roadmaps for achieving food sovereignty on the continent. The three-day meeting under the auspices of the second edition of the Feed Africa Summit lays out action-driven discourse on how heads of state would mobilize government resources and leverage development partners and private sector financing to harness Africa's food and agriculture potential and turn advocacy efforts into concrete actions. With the theme, Feeding Africa, Food Security and Resilience, the summit is organized by the African Development Bank Group. It will be held from Wednesday to Friday at the International Conference Center in Daman Daniel. And uh, UAE-based energy company Master has signed agreements with Angola, Uganda, and Zambia for developing renewable energy projects with a combined capacity of up to five gigawatts. The agreements were signed under the Etihad Seven Initiative, a global development fund launched by the UAE to provide clean electricity to 100 million people across Africa by 2035. Etihad 7 aims to raise funds for both the public and private sectors to help develop Africa's renewable energy sector. The projects are part of Azerbaijan's uh, efforts to source 30% of its domestic power requirements from renewables by 2020, 2030, beg your pardon, as well as diversify its economy and reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. However, many residents say that whether it is ESCOM's official or permanent, that it may not work. We move over to Egypt now, where the country has signed a $1.5 billion financing agreement with the International Islamic Trade Finance Corporation to fund its trading, including imports of energy products and essential commodities 
CNBC Arabia wrote on and saying that the citing the head of the corporation that last year Egypt signed a similar agreement also worth $1.5 billion with ITFC, which is headquartered in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and often funds Egypt's commodities imports, including grains and petroleum. Egypt's planning minister said that the financing cooperation portfolio between Egypt and the cooperation totals $14.5 billion so far. Well, that's the program for today, Monday. We do have another one coming up tomorrow. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Enjoy the rest of your day.